everyone. Good morning and welcome to First Things First. I'm Jenna Wolf. That's the Hall of Fame of Chris Carter. This right here is Nick Wright. Basketball is over. Basketball drama is not. Miami seems to think Russ is a perfect fit for the Heat. Hey, hold off on assuming you know what the Lakers will look like next season, says the head coach. But we're going to start this morning with one Kawhi Leonard. The two-time finals MVP has reportedly signed a three-year deal worth $103 million with the Clippers. Turned a few heads who assumed and reported he'd probably sign for four years. The last year of a deal is a player option. So that means that in 2021, Kawhi could be a free agent again if he chooses. It also means his contract now matches up with that of new teammate Paul George. See, I'll start with you. What does this contract tell you about Kawhi Leonard's future? Well, we found out a lot when Kawhi was a free agent. We found out a number of things that were quite surprising. For one is how aggressive he was as far as recruiting other players, star players, to be able to play with them. Had conversations with Kevin Durant, had conversations with Kyrie Irving, convinced Paul George to be able to get traded to the Clippers. So we do know that. Um, I'm not surprised by the short-term contract because he, he has to be a free agent once he reaches 10 years tenure in the NBA. It wouldn't have made sense. People thought that only the Toronto Raptors could sign him to a short-term deal. If he signed anywhere else, it was going to be a long-term deal. So he wants to be a free agent on that 10th year. You have to be from a strategy standpoint because your salary jumps at that point. And you know Kawhi wants to leverage to be able to move and or have leverage over the club. That's why he signed that two in a one year. Because after the 10-year tenure, he's just finished his eighth season. He's going to be a free agent again. I think it has more to do with him and controlling what he wants to do and the constant pressure he can keep on the organization. If they decide to change coaches at Doc Rivers, he would have a say-so about that. But ultimately, to, uh, to recruit other players to be able to come to the Clippers, it gave him the leverage and the flexibility to be able to do what he wants to do. Money and power is what this is about. The money is what Chris talked about there. The, just the way the collective bargaining agreement's written, you can get a bigger percentage of the salary cap, the biggest percentage once you've been in the league 10 years. So that's why the two plus one instead of the three plus one. But more notably than the money is the power. The power to continue to hold a bit of a vice grip on the organization. Because the Clippers know this now. They, in theory, could lose Paul George and Kawhi Leonard after the 2021 season, and they do not have control over their drafts starting in 2022. 22, 23, 24, 25, and 26. Those five years, OKC either has their picks outright or has a pick swap. So you, you damn sure better make sure Kawhi Leonard's happy. You damn sure better make sure Paul George is happy and you are competing for championships. And this is the new NBA. The, the, we are going to be on a constant cycle of this free agent class is great, but the one a couple years from now is going to be even better because guys are not signing five-year deals. Yes, Kawhi will be eligible in two years for a four-year, $196 million contract, but what makes anyone think he'd sign that and give up that power as opposed to a two plus one, 140, $145 million contract? This is... People thought LeBron was the outlier, signing those one plus ones in Cleveland, eventually a two plus one in Cleveland. That is not going to be the outlier. That is going to be more the norm for a select few, for first and second team All NBA caliber players, because it keeps the pressure on the franchise to never take a step back, to never be worried about the luxury tax, to never go back on the promises that were made to Kawhi in the recruitment phase. Was there something though to to those that thought he should have signed a long term deal that he he's had had a little bit of history with injury? Maybe this is a guarantee for for longer years and a little guarantee for for more mm -hmm. money and stability to a guy that did miss some time because of injury? Well, what it speaks to, he's not worried about getting hurt. Because if he was worried about getting hurt, he would sign the maximum number of years that you could. But where he is right now, he's very, very comfortable. But you got to give yourself the flexibility. 
If you're not concerned about your health, John Wall, John Wall did the smart thing. He signed that long-term contract. We got Dame there in Portland. He just signed a long-term contract. I, I, could, I could understand if a guy did that. But Kawhi, with his 10th year, two years away, he's got to be able to give himself the flexibility. Because not, on, not only are him and Paul George, not only are they the current team that they have, but they're going to be the future. There ain't no draft picks. Like, the only way you can add through them is be able to keep these, and when they go out, recruit other guys to be able to come to Los Angeles to be able to play with them because you can pretty much guarantee that they're going to be there. But people should also understand, once he picked the Clippers, the uh, he, the longest contract he could sign would have been a 3-plus-1. This is a 2-plus-1. So it's not as if he could have signed a five-year deal with the Clippers because they were not the incumbent team. But it does mean 20. So the 2020 free agency class is a very weak one. In 2021, if players exercise their options, if guys don't sign early extensions, the following guys are free agents. Giannis, Kawhi, LeBron, Paul George, Blake Griffin, Bradley Beal, Rudy Gobert, C.J. McCollum, Victor Oladipo. Go down the list. It's, it is a third of the top 20 players in the league and then some. And that is, listen, the league, Adam Silver can talk about the owners not liking the level of pressure the players can put on an organization okay the the way around this is one of these two or both of these two allow for seven or eight year contracts the way you used to because it's one thing to say i'll give up one year of guaranteed money to be able to exert pressure it's another thing to say i'll give up four years of guaranteed right. money to be able to exert pressure or remove the individual player maximums remove the individual have someone be able to offer a player 60% of the cap instead of 35% of the cap. But as the CBA is currently written, it's in the player's interest, if they're a top player in this league, to go short-term deals and continue to be able to put the screws to the team. You can't possibly have any doubt that Jerry West won't be able to keep these guys. Do you think Kawhi Leonard wants to stay with the Clippers, wants to be a Clipper for longer than the two years? I mean, Jerry West hoped to be alive. <laughs> I mean, Jerry West is no, no young guy. Uh, Kawhi Leonard wants to be a Clipper, but it doesn't make sense for him to sign a three and a one, a four-year deal. It doesn't make sense. doesn't make sense as far as where he is. He just finished his eighth season. You know you got that big jump coming after year number 10 and the flexibility. Like, we were shocked at how Kawhi recruited other players to be able to come there. That will continue. And him being able to say, hey, man, I'm going to be a free agent. I can be a free agent. I can opt into the contract. I can sign long term. That's what other guys are looking, and he can kind of help control that roster. And you want to be able to make sure the team doesn't at some point. We saw the Miami Heat all of a sudden tail into LeBron's time there. Oh, uh, we're not going to bring Mike Miller back. We want to avoid the luxury tax. We saw the Cleveland Cavaliers, another LeBron example, the one year he didn't right. have the ability to opt out of a deal. They don't bring back David Griffin. We, we know that when Kawhi was meeting with the Lakers, the Clippers, the Raptors, there were certain demands he made, certain requests he made about what his load management would be, about the medical staff, about how the team was going to treat him. You, you, once you sign the contract, if they renege on that, there's nothing you can do, especially if you've signed for the maximum number of years. This now ensures the team has to keep its word in that regard. Moving on to a guy who does not struggle in the NBA. His name is LeBron James, plays for the Lakers. Last week it was reported that LeBron would be the team's de facto point guard next season. From there, a plethora of potential Laker lineups for this team were thrown around. This was all before we heard from the head coach. Yesterday at Summer League play, Frank Vogel was asked about his team's lineup. Here's what he had to say. There is no decisions made on our starting lineup. Um, no imminent plan to start LeBron at the point guard spot. Uh, a lot of different uh, lineups and combinations have, dis have been discussed, but it's, it's really way too early for any of that. Um, he'll be a primary ball handler uh, in our system the same way he has been uh, his entire career, but we're certainly not going to ask him to, to do anything that he hasn't uh, done his entire career. So, um, you know, it's going to be a, a situation of just putting all our guys in the, in the best position to have success on the basketball court and looking forward for it uh, all to take place at the right time. All right, Nick. Everything you just heard, all that being said, you still think that LeBron should be the Lakers' starting point guard next season? Yes, and that's their easy decision.
That, that, that's not the complicated one. LeBron should be and will be their starting point guard because they don't have, in 2019, a starting caliber point guard on the roster. Rondo's not that anymore. Mm -hmm. Quinn Cook's never been that. Caruso was a nice story, a guy that you didn't know was going to make the team and ended up playing some decent minutes for him last year. But LeBron's their best option. Go yeah, ahead, and we, maybe we should just get out of saying starting point guard. And like the coach said, the primary ball handler. Because if you look at Steph Curry... We know D'Angelo Russell, he's going to be the point guard. Steph Curry's going to play off the ball. What's the difference between the, the difference primary ball handler and the point guard? The difference is running off of screens. LeBron, the number one skill he has outside of his body being incredible is his ability to be able to see the basketball, his basketball IQ, and, man, LeBron has even gone back in the past and, and watched NBA video games to watch where guys like to shoot. He looks at guys' stats. Where do they like the ball? What's their dominant hand? When they like to drive, when they're coming off the pick and roll. Those things, LeBron, you can take advantage of if he's on the ball in the, in, in the primary ball handler in the offense. If he's not, then you don't get that advantage. If you don't, especially if you don't have another competent, high-level guard. And so, but here's the complicating factor. It's not who's going to start at the one for the Lakers, because that'll be LeBron. It's the five position and the trickle down from there. Because I threw out a bunch of lineups that involved Anthony Davis starting at the five, and I got two separate text messages from two separate people saying, Anthony Davis is not going to start the season at the five. Maybe in the playoffs, maybe at the end of games, but stop saying he's going to be be the starting center, even though you think he should be the starting center, not going to happen. Were both those texts from and so, him? No, no, no. It's <laughs> no, no. I told him on the air, but you, he, but, but but you told but me on I'm the air sure that you didn't he, want it. That you that you said he's Anthony never wanted Davis it. has yes. been on the record and been Sen consistent. I right. do not want to play center. Doesn't want to play center, and my argument was, okay, well, what you want and what's best for the team are two separate things. Turns out what Anthony Davis wants, at least what I'm being told, is going to be at least how they start the season. So, if LeBron's your starting point guard, you're going to have a center, whether that's JaVale or Boogies. One of them's going to start for who cares who, just a center. Then Anthony Davis. You also know Danny Green's starting. That leaves you one position. Now, people are going to say, well, obviously Kuzma. Well, is it obviously Kuzma? If it is Kuzma, who's guarding the opposing team's point guard? And is there enough shooting out there? Because Danny Green's a knockdown shooter, but Kuzma last year was a bad three-point shooter. He would have to get back to rookie year three-point shooting, Kyle Kuzma. And even then, is that enough shooting? Does Contavious Caldwell Pope find his way into the starting lineup? Would it be Avery There's Bradley? no way he's going to start. Would it be Avery Bradley? Is there any chance Kuzma's coming off the bench to run that unit? If not then you have a question about, are you going to ask Danny Green, your best wing defender, the guy who should be guarding the other team's best wing, to start the games guarding the other team's point guard? The, the, if you have LeBron, Anthony Davis, and a center all in your starting lineup, and LeBron's the point guard, you're going to have a big lineup, and some of that shooting the Lakers acquired in this offseason is going to have trouble getting on the court, see? Yeah, I mean, it, ultimately, as far as the center position, I didn't think it was as complicated as people were trying to make it out. Boogie Cousins, JaVale McGee, when they go to training camp, whoever plays the best, Boogie says his quad is completely healed. I believe he's a lot better player than what we saw in the playoffs. You made a point. Say he didn't come back in the playoffs. Would you be more excited about Boogie Cousins being the center for the Lakers if you didn't see him where he couldn't jump over a pizza box right. after forcing himself back? Because you got to give him credit for that. You can't, you can't on one hand say, you know, I want athletes to be able to try to push themselves, which Boogie Cousins did because originally they thought he was done for the season. And then he comes back, pushes himself, does all and the things And we hold it against him. And, and, and he yep. looks bad. And then we hold it against him. So I believe Boogie Cousins should be the starting center. Now, as far as three-point shooting, I believe Boogie Cousins will shoot above 27% he did last year. I believe Anthony Davis will shoot better than he did last year. And LeBron. So you just have to get some of that three-point production to be able to spread the court to keep teams honest by your bigs. You don't have to always have small guys on the court that are stretching the court. We saw that with um, Shannon Fry. When, when, Channing Fry. Chan, yep. Channing Fry, when he was there in Cleveland. A great example of pick and pop. A big guy who can stretch the court just like smaller guys. Can. Nick, be honest. You trust that guy right there to make all these decisions, the decisions that no one seems to be able to find a good starting five for this team. 
That guy. Well, is listen, make I, it. Frank Vogel. This is where his job is very difficult, and this is where had they gotten Kawhi, not only would they have three of the top seven players in the league, but the coaching job would have been way easier. You have three superstars that are going. At least two of them are going to be on the court at all times, and then you have minimum level players and buyout guys that fill out the rotation. Now you've got a roster where you probably have eight guys who think they should be starting. You have of Kuzma. Can Davis Caldwell Pope and Avery Bradley, three guys who all have been starters in their career, Kuzma, who's making the least money but is the best player, KCP, who's making the most money but arguably is the worst player, right. Bradley, who's the best defender when healthy, and this team needs that skill set out there. So you have one spot for those three players, and there is a little bit of a mix and match here. And that is what the beginning of the season is going to be about to a degree, figuring out which lineups play well together. And that's not even to mention – Rajon Rondo was a big personality and a guy that averaged eight assists per game last year when he did play, when he was healthy, just all of a sudden being eliminated from the starting lineup, which I, by the way, think he should be eliminated from the starting lineup, but I'm sure Rondo doesn't feel that way. Yes, Frank Vogel, even if Kawhi signs with the Lakers, we still got question marks about him today. I don't have as many question marks about other people. He's got a three-year guarantee, so as far as pressure, I got two of the top six players that don't seem like a whole bunch of pressure to me. They got a better bench than we thought they were going to be able to do because they waited on the Kawhi sweepstakes. So regardless, if they had Kawhi there, people would still question Frank Vogel. To me, it's a built-in excuse. Let's blame it on the coach. LeBron, everywhere he's been, it's been questions about the coach. He's never had a great coach. Ty Lue, people didn't have no hell of a confidence in Ty Lue. They got confidence after LeBron and Kyrie, and that team put together a special run. Frank Vogel, he's going to be on the hot seat all year, not just because Jason Kidd's there, not because Lionel Hollins is, is there, no, but because it's an easy excuse if guys don't play well. If they don't shoot the ball well, it's going to be we're going to blame it on the coach. It's an easy I, – I, I just – think the players in the NBA, they control things a lot more than the coach does. So we want to blame someone? Oh, let's blame the coach compared to looking at them guys out there in the uniform and realize that, you know something? They control their own face. Okay, now let's move on. It's hard to stay in shape. You make $20 million a year. Uh, <laughs> what do you got to do? Stay in shape. It's Stories me to up. start your morning. <laughs> Yesterday it was revealed that Kawhi Leonard signed a three-year deal worth $103 million with the Clippers. Many thought he'd sign for four years. See, what would you make of Kawhi's new deal? It lets you know that he has to be a free agent after the 10 years of service, setting him up. He just finished his eighth year. Very, very smart by his agent. And Kawhi and his team let me know that it was on the board for him signing short-term deals. There's a little miscommunication between me and them as far as was it going to be a long term because the general public thought that only a short term, term deal existed with the Raptors. He was not going to sign a long term deal with any team. The, and again, people should understand, as you mentioned, Jenna, the longest he could have signed with the Clippers was four, which would have been a three plus one. He ends up signing a two plus one, but it also keeps the scrutiny and the pressure on the Clippers. Not that Ballmer and Doc Rivers and that crew wasn't going to do everything they could to win already, but he and Just Paul George could walk out the door in two years and then the Clippers would be left without their own draft No picks way to the rebuild. Next, no way. 2022 to 2026, those five drafts, OKC either has the pick or has a pick swap. So critical two seasons coming up for the Los Angeles Clippers, even more than we thought. All right, injury update now on Boogie Cousins. Boogie Cousins is injury-free. Boogie tore his quad in the first round of the playoffs against the Clippers. He was able to come back and play in the finals, but clearly he wasn't fully healthy. Boogie now says his quad is 100% healed. All right, Nick, what are fair expectations then for Cousins next season? Well, listen, I think Boogie can still be a guy that gives you at least 15 and 8 if he gets the minutes available to do that, if he plays 24, 26 minutes a game. I, I don't want to hold against him what I saw in the finals. It's hard not to, but when we saw him tear his quad in his second playoff game ever, we thought that was going to be the last we ever saw of him with Golden State. He fought all the way back, basically cut a month off off the expected recovery time 
And then he looked really bad a lot of the time once we saw him back. And that's your most vivid memory of Boogie. But if he had not fought it all the way back, see, mm -hmm. we wouldn't have had that memory. And we'd have said, man, he was looking good the final month of the regular season. I'd like to afford him that benefit of the doubt. But it is hard because it looked like he couldn't jump four inches off the ground in those NBA finals. The best thing about him announcing he's 100% now is we got about two and a half, two month, two and a half months until training camp opens. He won't be rehabbing this year. Last year, all he did was rehab. Rehab workouts are totally different than I'm trying to get ready for endurance and trying to get ready to play an 82-game schedule. To me, Boogie Cousins is the best value at $3.5 million in the league. Tell me, tell me another player as good as him. 3.5, that's all you're paying for him. So it's not like we're paying this guy 10 or 15 million. There's a lot of guys in the league making 10 million, and they're not very good at basketball. I believe this is going to be one of his better off seasons, and he'll fit in with the Lakers well. All right, let's talk some football. Folks over at Pro Football Focus have predicted that Ezekiel Elliott will win his third rushing title this season. Zeke would be the first back to win three rushing titles in four seasons since Barry Sanders. Wow. So you think Zeke will lead the league in rushing next season? I knew when he came into the league, he would lead the league as a rusher for a number of years. He's the best pure runner that we have in football. Couple won the best offensive line. Last couple years, offensive line hadn't been good. It's been Zeke, more Zeke than them. This year, they should be a little bit more healthy. Yes, he's the best pure runner that we have. You add Amari Cooper. You put Randall Cobb in the slot. This is the best offense that Ezekiel Elliott would have played on since his days at Ohio State. And I wonder if that actually might prevent him from winning his third rushing title in four years because if the Cowboys' passing attack takes the steps forward that they hope it does with Amari Cooper being there for a full offseason and the full year and the addition of Randall Cobb Zeke's not, not having to rely on Zeke quite Most of the time it doesn't work that way. If he leads the league in rushing, if their offense can score in the red zone, if they're one of the top five teams on third down conversions, that's how everyone's ever able to eat. I played on a lot of talented offenses, and man, them third downs become important. You know why? Because you get another three downs to be able to spread it around. Sure. And in the red zone, you got to score points. I wouldn't be surprised if he scored 20 touchdowns. Well, that's year. what I was about to say is I think what's more important to the Cowboys is if he can lead the league in touchdowns rather than just rushing yards. All right, let's get finish up with some basketball. Sixers currently have the second best odds to win the East behind the Milwaukee Bucks. However, Philly forward James Ennis thinks that Philly is going to walk to the finals now that Kawhi is out West. You agree, Nick? Do you think the Sixers are legit contenders for the finals next season? Well, I do not agree, but I do absolutely think they're legit contenders for the finals. What James Ennis said is ridiculous. Like, that's a, that's a foolish comment Who is for he? a team. He's going to be their sixth man. I mean, he, I mean, he's bounced around the league a bit. He did play well in the playoffs He did play well in the playoffs, year. but he is clearly, at best, He's the fifth best guy on that team. He's probably the sixth or seventh best guy on the t that team. We'll see what Zaire Smith and Josh Richardson do for them this year. But listen, Philly is has the ability to be the best team in the Eastern Conference. I need to see the fit. I need to see if they can be as dominant defensively as I believe they have the personnel to be. They are going to start one of the longest teams we've ever, one of the tallest teams we've ever seen start in an NBA season, when Josh Richardson's your smallest guy, when the median height of your starting lineup is 6'10", that is a long arm in When you bring Al defense. Horford into that mix. Absolutely right. Al Horford is one of the smartest players in the league, and even though his athleticism is not very good, he can knock down shots and is an excellent all-NBA caliber defender. But the X factor for Philly, and I'm sure Chris will expand on it, is of course going to be Ben Simmons. If Ben Simmons comes back better, if Ben Simmons comes back to where he is not a liability at the end of games offensively and a liability in a playoff series, then Philly can go man for man with Milwaukee. You, even if Giannis is better than Embiid, Embiid's close enough that the rest of the roster for Philly would outshine what Milwaukee has, but that assumes something that I did assume year one to year two, but I got burnt by it, so I can't assume year two to year three, which is that Ben Simmons expands his range a little bit. I was dead wrong after his rookie season, saying, of course he'll get better. Of course he'll get in the gym. Even if he doesn't have a three-point shot, he'll have mid-range shot. He didn't. He was two of 25 last year outside of 16 feet. So, they have a clear ceiling in Philadelphia unless Ben Simmons improves, no matter what James Innes says. But because Kawhi left, they are, without a doubt, one of the two best teams in the conference. Yeah, I, 
I don't like people, especially who don't have championship experience, putting out these types of sound bites when now the rest of the team, they got to be able to vouch for They got to answer for it. This is not about fit in Philly, even though they've made some changes. This is about two things. One you mentioned as far as um, the fit with the players, but it's not about the fit. It's about fitness. Fitness and jump shot, all right? Joel Embiid and his fitness, is he ever going to get himself in the top shape that that's not a detriment, that he's not missing games, missing time, because he doesn't have an NBA pro diet. He doesn't have someone cooking his food. He's still eating Taco Bell. I got friends that see Joel Embiid a lot of times in Philadelphia, and I'm not talking about at the basketball arena. And Joel Embiid and what he puts in his body, that has been part of the issue now he's hired someone he's working with someone here in new york so that's the update on his body he's doing something about that what's the update on ben simmons jump shot didn't you guys get it didn't you guys see the video no oh that is the update it ain't no better you know the reason why the season's been over with a month and he ain't put no video out there there ain't no good video to put out there jenna it's as simple in the off season that's when you are able to me, I used to break down my game with my coaches and say, what are the weakest routes that I run in the passing tree? Because this offseason, those routes, I will move up to be a priority. I won't even run the things that I'm very, very good at. And that's how the best players we've ever seen in any sport, that's how the good become great. That's how the greats become legends. And y'all let me know when y'all see some video, see video of Ben Simmons because I'm sick and tired of my buddy over here appropriate. Oh, yeah, he's going to get to the gym. Oh, yeah, he's going to get to the gym. That was a year ago. I said I learned my lesson on it. I Like, listen, I, I assumed he would do what most blue chip young players Tom do. Tom Brady's outrun the 40-yard dash at 42. You know the reason why? Because he wants you to know, Jenna. I'm one of the best that's ever done it, and no young kid's going to take my spot. Antonio, you think we ain't got nothing better to do but to show him up there on the bouncing ball with the goggles? <laughs> True. No, because that's what you're supposed to do. All right. Well, I know Ben Simmons is the obstacle right now mm -hmm. for, for the Sixers, but wouldn't the other real X factor be Giannis? I mean, well, isn't Giannis going to be the real X factor well, for the Sixers? Milwaukee right now gets to go into the season as the clear favorites in the East because not only they have the best record, but the team that knocked them out is now totally different. Kawhi Leonard put, it, put the claw on Giannis and it changed that series. So usually we would say, hey, you got to beat the champs, but it's not that dissimilar to the Cavs were four-time defending Eastern Conference champs last season. Did it seem like it? No, because LeBron left the team. They were a different team. Toronto won't be that bad, but they will be a different team. But Embiid is Embiid is in that the top of that very next tier of NBA stars. Like if Giannis is in that top seven superstar tier, Embiid to the very top of the next tier. Tobias Harris is a max player. I think he can go eye to eye with Chris Middleton. Al Horford can go eye to eye with Brooke Lopez. Like their top of the roster matches up well. And so the question is, Ben Simmons, Eric Bledsoe. Bledsoe struggled in the playoffs, but was not the liability that Ben Simmons was, and we kind of know what we're getting from Bledsoe. If Ben Simmons improves, then James Ennis can be proven correct. They won't cakewalk, like that's a silly comment. If he doesn't, then they will be limited, especially against a team in a series as good defensively as I'm willing to bet you a Milwaukee significant is. amount of money as far as Ben Simmons, his percentages outside of 10 feet, and the three-point line, oh, that's like a foreign country. You can forget <laughs> the three-point line. That's a, I mean, he, he'll never be able to he shoot out there. two shots outside of 16 feet all year, which seems impossible. But all so year? you know something? Yeah, Last yeah. year, he only made two more shots than me. Yeah, that's true. That's true. Yeah. And only took 25 of them. It's unbelievable. All right, moving on to things that we can infer from Instagram postings. Yesterday on the gram, Russell Westbrook liked a picture of himself wearing a Miami Heat jersey, even though he's still a member of the OKC Thunder. A new report says that the Heat willing to take on Russ's money and Russ's personality. All right, see, how does Russ need to adjust his game moving forward if he wants to be more effective? Uh, well, the thing about it, Russ has got to play with some veteran players. You can't put Russ on a young team. Also, you got to put Russ 
with some guys that can shoot the basketball. Typically, you would think if OKC is going to be at their absolute best, they got to be a top 10 defensive team. They got to be a team that plays with a lot of pace. Him and Steven Adams in the pick and roll, very, very effective. But Russ's ability to go off the bounce, get into the lane, break down the defense. But when you have only limited shooters, and if you look at the last several years, since KD's left, they have not put the type of shooters that would help Russ develop his game. Last year, you could see he deferred to Paul George. Paul George was playing spectacular. But who else have they put around him? I'm talking about knockdown shooters that Russ, once he gets into the lane, he's got viable options to dish the ball out compared to shooting a, m a much more difficult contested shot at which, the rim. Which is why Miami might feel like, but we will do a better job than OKC has done at surrounding him with talent. We will be able to present him with another all-star caliber player in Jimmy Butler who's already here. A player in Jimmy Butler who a lot of people thought Jimmy Butler and Paul George were almost – were nearly identical in like player rankings going into last season. Now, Paul George had a far better year than Jimmy Butler, and Paul George right now appears to be the better player than Jimmy Butler. We'll see next season with George coming off the two shoulder surgeries. But for us, it's really simple. It is last year, it wasn't just his free throw shooting went to hell. He's always been a bad three-point shooter. Last year was his worst three-point shooting year he's had since he's been a star. And he's now in very rough company. He's the second worst high volume three point shooter in NBA history. Only Charles Barkley has taken 2,000 plus threes in the NBA with the worst percentage. Russ is now beneath guys like Jerry Stackhouse and Allen Iverson and guys that we thought of as chuckers from three. He's below 31% from his career from three and he takes a bunch of them. Like last year he was taking over five a game. I. We've seen him shoot 34% from his first season. The year that he won the MVP, he was 85% from the line, or I think about 35% from three. If, if He's a guy that he, he has shown the ability to adjust the style in which he plays at least a little bit within a season. But last year didn't matter if he adjusted the style because he was bad shooting everywhere. The free throw line, the mid-range jump shot, which used to be his bread and butter, that little elbow jumper, that used to be his go-to shot. And his three-point shot was broken. If he's going to be successful, he has to be in year 12. This is going to be year 12 now. He has to be an adequate three-point shooter. There is no way for a guard in the NBA at his age moving forward to be a, a, a superstar in this league if you can't shoot the ball. And Russ last year could not shoot the ball, but he still shot the ball. So to me, the, yeah, there's the personality stuff. How will he fit in with a new team? Never been with a different organization. Spolstra, Butler, all that stuff. But it really is, can Russell Westbrook shoot 34% from three? If he can, he can still be a great player in this league. If he's at 28%, as he was a lot of last year, and he's still shooting a bunch of them, that's the percentage Draymond shot, but he's shooting twice as many. That's a huge problem for whatever team he'd be. It's a lot to ask someone to say, okay, you got to get you got to go get back to your numbers that you were. So go to a new team. Give it. Isn't it more realistic that they're going to have to say, hey, you can't take this many shots. You're going to come here, but you're going to have to reduce the number of shots you take. And is he going to be able to make that adjustment? No, I don't believe that's realistic. I don't believe there's a whole bunch of people going to tell Russ, you got to stop shooting the basketball. Last season, no one had the ball more than Russ. 90 times per game, he's got the ball. Only James Harden has the ball more amount of time. So for me, if you're not shooting it, he could be a better distributor of the basketball. Cut down on his turnovers. He could be a better defender. So there's a lot of things that Miami and the switch there can be able to help them. Miami's one of the least effective teams in the pick and roll, even though they run about the same amount as OKC. Spolster and them have to be able to let him go and let him get his points early in the offense, get a pace that's a little bit faster. I believe Russ can still do that at a high level compared to the half-court offense. To me, that's one of the big conflicts that you have with Russ. He's far more effective in the open court than when they slow the ball down. And he and the Oklahoma City Thunder before the All-Star break, he was playing well, Paul George was playing well. We were talking about could they get all the way to the two seed in the West and then fell apart once Paul George dealt with his shoulder injuries and Russ had a really bad stretch post-All-Star break. If he can get back to just stylistically the way he was pre-All-Star break and add a couple percentage points to his shot, still be one of the best six guards in basketball, but that's what they would be betting on if they trade for him in Miami.
Hey, this is Nick Wright from First Things First, and you have to check out this website, Pristine. Dot com. Pristine Auction has daily auctions with $1 starting bids. Authenticity is important to Pristine Auction. Pristine Auction guarantees authenticity and it comes with authentication from the most trusted sources. Pristine Auctions are affordable. Most people don't think they can afford this stuff, but it's much more affordable than you think. A Dick Buck is signed Bears jersey sold for just $56 and a Mike Tyson autographed boxing glove sold for under a hundred bucks. It's quick and free to register. Bidding is free and you only pay if you win. Use registration code FTF when joining P-R-I-S-T-I-N-E dot com and new users will receive a $5 auction credit. Again, you'll get a $5 auction credit when using registration code F. TF to sign up for pristine.com. That's P R I S T I N E dot com. Back here, first things first, with MS1 <laughs> NBA analyst Sarah Kustock. Hey, Sarah. Well, great to see you guys. It is great to see you. How's it going? It's great. You, got, you all are testing me with really. Uh, Talk strong commercial fires. breaks. Yeah, 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 the strong commercial yeah. breaks. We test you in the commercial break so you can perform. How did you sleep last night? Whew. Excellent. Okay, good. good. Excellent. Well, like good. A good night of rest. Like a baby. Right. Let's talk some nets, Sarah. There were a number when you sleep, of do you, reports. Do you dream? <laughs> Stop. 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 At the end of the season, <laughs> just about see if teams dreams were crowded, man. that were wary of signing Kyrie Irving because of his rumored leadership skills. Recently, Brooklyn said coach Kenny Atkinson was asked about Kyrie. Coach said he doesn't want to prejudge him, that he wants Kyrie to have his best season ever. He also said you don't know a guy until you coach him. Sarah, how will Kyrie fit in Brooklyn? I, I believe it's going to be an excellent fit. And similar to what Kenny Atkinson said, you don't know until you have a guy in your gym every day playing with the rest of your team and the rest of your roster until you actually see how it melds together. However, Kyrie Irving's coming in, and I know that he got a bad rap in Boston, but he had a season where he averaged 24, 7, and 5, mm -hmm. right around there, shot 40% from the three-point line. He's one of the most talented and skilled guys with the ball in his hands, the way he creatively finishes. And this is a team that likes to get up and down. They like to shoot a lot of threes. They do share the basketball. However, we saw last year with D'Angelo Russell, they utilize the pick and roll. They like to use ball screens. They use a lot of off-ball actions. So all of that said with how talented Kyrie is offensively fitting in with an already strong core of players, everyone understanding their roles. And the flip side of things, I know a lot of people focus on the defensive end. Guess who's going to be next to him? It's either going to be Karis LeVert, 6'7", Karis LeVert, mm -hmm. who is one of the strong defenders on the other end. 6'6", Spencer Dinwiddie, uh, who is a talented defensive player, along with being able to play on or off the ball. You got shooters and Joe Harris, big men and Jared Allen. And on top of all of this, as we continue to talk about with Kyrie Irving, he chose to play here. He's playing amongst friends. He's with people that he wants to be with. He's going back home. So I think all of those things are what makes this a situation that's going to be, I think, really advantageous and beneficial for both sides. All right, before I get into my opinion on this, I think a lot of people that are watching have a much better idea of who Kyrie Irving is than who Kenny Atkinson is. Yes. And so Brad Stevens, non confrontational coach. Ty Lu, not an overly confrontational coach. His last two coaches. David Blatt was just swimming without goggles. He, he was mm -hmm. trying to figure out what was what. Kenny Atkinson, I haven't watched, I haven't been up as up close and personal as you have, but I've seen enough Nets games, been to enough games where he will get in your face. He will yell at a guy. Tell the audience about who he is and how you think that relationship could go. Kenny Atkinson, and I say this saying through, and I won't divulge too much, but being able to sit through practices, watch the in and outs, the day-to-day, -day, see how he is with guys. This is in a practice setting with a full team. This is skill workouts. This is one-on-one -on -one individual work. Kenny Atkinson is one of the most dedicated, committed, gritty guys that you mm -hmm. will see as a coach, but he's also fearless in how he interacts yes. with players. And he is going to treat everyone the exact same. And, and you brought up the word confrontational, and there's a reason why everyone on the Brooklyn Nets team, D'Angelo Russell being one of those, 
really was attracted to Kenny and the way in which he coached because he's a player's coach in a sense that he's going to do whatever it takes to get the best out of you, mm -hmm. but doing so in a way that he's going to get in your face. And he may cuss you out. And he may be someone who does things that you don't appreciate in the moment, but at the end of the day, you know how much he cares about you. He's one of the most sincere human beings, and he loves you as a player. So with all of that being said, I too think Kenny has got an excellent staff along mm -hmm. with him that works with these players. I mean, Kenny's out barefoot chasing rebounds and, and getting it. He, he's got his ankles taped and practicing with the guys, going through drills, showing them things hands-on. Um, so for all of those reasons, is it going to be an adjustment period? Probably. It is with every player. But because of that, I think the respect goes top to bottom with all the other players. But I think for Kyrie Irving, he is going to have someone that is as up close with him, mm -hmm. in it with him as he can find. And I think at the end of the day, he'll realize that what Kenny wants is for him to be the best player, and, and that is what any guy should want. Yeah, we're going to have plenty of eyeballs on Kenny Axon as a head coach. He cut his teeth in the Atlanta organization and player development. So this is how he coached. He's on the court developing players, giving guys drills. The number one way to get a professional athlete's attention is to make him better at something. And that's how he's done that. And that's why they selected him as a coach. That's why they have confidence in him. That's why you saw all their young players get so much better. The style for which they play at is conducive to Kyrie getting better. Not only do they have DeAndre Jordan, so he has someone to be able to finish at the rim. Because Kyrie can get into the paint. The lob game is back open for him. That hadn't been open for him. Not when he was in Cleveland. Because they didn't have a bunch of guys who can play above the rim. Right. And definitely not in Boston. They got better shooters in Brooklyn than, than, than he had in, with the Celtics. So the court's going to be more wide open. I just wish Kevin Durant was playing from day number one because I believe with him on the court, we would see the best Kyrie that we've seen since we saw in that final. So I do think the style for which them getting up and down – this offseason becomes important for Kyrie, the most important one since LeBron went back to Cleveland. Will he get his body in tip-top shape? Because there were teams that looked at Kyrie, and they were concerned long-term with his dedication, not to basketball, but his dedication to taking care of his body. And the coach made it clear yesterday, I'm giving him a clean slate. Right. Even though we've done our research, we know about Kyrie, but I'm going to give him a clean slate, and most coaches – when you start like that, it really gives the player a lot of confidence that he doesn't have to be perfect from day number one. Nick, Kyrie did much better last year, obviously, when the Celtics were winning than when they weren't losing. You saw that in body language. You saw that in post-game press conferences. Now you're going to have him starting on a team without KD, which mm -hmm. means if this team goes bad, a lot of that pressure is going to be on Kyrie. It's going to be, well, it was Kyrie's fault because yep. KD wasn't there. How do you think he'll be able to handle that? Well, listen, the onus is on Kyrie to not only keep them afloat, but to keep them going in this direction until KD steps on the court for the first time. This is a team that if they had just run it back, given the fact that Kawhi left the conference, given the fact that there's uncertainty after the top two teams, if they had made no changes, just brought back D'Angelo Russell, not signed Kevin Durant, we just said, could the Nets jump up to the three or the four seed, right? That would have yep. been the discussion. So it is Kyrie's job when they also added DeAndre Jordan, and I, he's clearly on the downside, but Jared Allen's back. Karis LeVert, you hope, be able to play the full season. Spencer Dinwiddie, sixth man of the year, Buzz. Like, this is a good young roster. If they are floundering, if they are fighting to be 500, of course it's going to fall on number 11's head. And it should. Now, I think Kyrie has the ability to be a great player in this league. We've seen it. What we haven't seen him be is a great player as the best player for everything that comes with that responsibility, everything that comes with that. He's going to have to do that until Kevin Durant comes out there. And I'm excited to see it because we know how special he is. We know there's not another player in the league with his specific set of skills. And I think the Spencer Dinwiddie relationship really matters. He was recruiting him all year, a la Draymond with Kevin Durant a few years ago. They're close friends. We know how close he is with Durant. He has a relationship with DeAndre Jordan. So does I don't think he had someone on the Celtics that when Kyrie was getting a skew could grab and be like, hey, bro, 
We need, we need you back here right now, and what you're doing is not working. I think they have that in Brooklyn. And, and I think that that's the biggest factor you look at, and you don't just point to one thing, mm -hmm. and I'm certainly not putting blame on Terry Rozier, Kyrie. Everyone plays a part of that, but you had a guy that was the backup to Kyrie Irving that felt like he could have been the starting point guard, and he was part of the reason that they went to the Eastern Conference Final. Yeah. This is such a different situation. Absolutely. And so that changes the entire complexion of during the ups, the downs, how I think the person perspective and mentality of the some of that blame game. for Kyrie in Boston is not his fault Jason Tatum not being an offensive player wasn't Kyrie's fault them having all those forwards to try to get in that rotation that's not his fault Rozier wanting to be a starter get a new contract that's not Kyrie's fault we gave Kyrie a lot of blame for what went on in Boston that was not his fault a lot of it Danny Ainge should assume some of that and Brad Stevens, Stevens did not have a good year he should assume some of that blame and we right. just saw last year real quick D'Angelo Russell being a guy that People said couldn't be a leader, couldn't fit in, was a well, character oh, yeah, issue. Great. Yes. One of the most beloved guys that I've seen in a while in Brooklyn. So really? I think it shows yep. how you can bring a guy in. <laughs> Kawhi Leonard now, two time finals MVP, has reportedly signed That's a three year good. deal worth $103 million with the Clippers. Turned a few heads who assumed he'd signed for four years. The last year of the deal is a player option. So that means in 2021, Kawhi could be a free agent again if he so chooses. It also means his contract now matches up with that of new teammate Paul George. See, what does this tell you about his future? Well, for one, he wasn't as concerned about his health as some other people. Because if he was concerned, you go ahead and get that Three extra plus year. one. Yep. You get the extra year. So one of the misinformation that was out there when Kawhi was going to sign was, the only short-term deal existed with him going back to Toronto. Oh, he would try to run it back with them on a one-and-one. -one. But no, it, Kawhi was not going to sign more than two years with any team that he looked at because he just finished his eighth season. It does not make sense for him to be under contract. He's got to be able to have that option because then he gets that big jump in his contract. So to me, it speaks on the leverage he wants to have, his overall health he's not concerned about. And the one of the most surprising things about free agency was how aggressive he was in taking the initiative to go out there and talk to players who he didn't have an existing relationship with and hadn't been in communication with. That right there was very surprising. To yeah, me. and you said it, the word leverage. I mean, this is exactly what we would anticipate out of Kawhi Leonard. It's a smart, shrewd, savvy move in doing what works best. And, and I don't necessarily think this is a bad thing for the Clippers, but ultimately it gives Kawhi the leverage and in the power to be able to when that player option comes out look at the roster look at the team he's someone that we talk so much about really wanting to trust an organization trust the medical staff trust everyone he's around and he can have that belief and confidence in the Clippers but until you're there until you're in it you don't ultimately know what exactly it's going to be like and I also think you bring up a great point about that 20 2021 free agent class, which this contract lines up with Paul George. It also lines up with LeBron James. It also lines up with Giannis Dettacumpo, mm -hmm. Bradley, some others. So I, I think for this, Kawhi Leonard is setting himself up in a really excellent position. It also allows the Clippers to as well, a minimum of two years, but allows the Clippers to, to continue to prove to Kawhi that this is the best place yes, for him Yes, I remember be. LeBron James when he initially went to the Miami Heat. There were a number of things he had talked about with the organization, but he didn't get it in his contract. They had just talked about him. Exactly right. Man, as soon as LeBron signed, man, Pat Riley took a lot of that stuff away. Yep. LeBron was like, hey, I, I thought we had whatever was in the contract as far as seats, people in the locker room, VIP services, all the stuff he had in Cleveland. That no longer existed once he went to Miami. LeBron learned something. A lot of the handshake agreement stuff, yeah. the stuff that wasn't in the contract. These guys, the, the the special dispensation he had received in Cleveland, he was not given to Miami, and then he got it back when he went back to Cleveland. Like, we are now to a point in the NBA, this is not for all guys. Hell, I mean, Reggie Bullock just had the Knicks basically say, hey, the contract we agreed to, it's not available to you anymore. And Marcus Morris went to the Spurs and said, I'm going to go take his contract. So there, for if you're not a top 12 guy, th what I'm about to say doesn't apply to you. But if you are a difference maker, if you are a guy that can turn the fate of a franchise with your decision, you become eye to eye with the owner as far as most powerful people in that organization, as long as you have the credible threat to leave, as long as you have a free agency or an option year hanging over their head. And so the owners 
did not want these seven-year deals anymore that became albatrosses. And what they didn't expect or what they didn't anticipate was the butterfly effect of that, the unintended consequence of that is guys can sign with your team and all and immediately be approaching free agency. And what they didn't anticipate was how many guys at the top of the league who already have hundreds of millions of dollars will make decisions that at first blush look like the wrong financial ones that will say, oh, the Spurs can give me five years, $200 million. No, I want out of here. Oh, the Raptors can give me the most money. No, I want out of here. Oh, the Clippers can give me four years, 140. No, I'll take three years, 103. That they will continually turn down enormous amounts of money because they already have so much money in order to be able to have leverage. And the other aspect of this is this does let him hit free agency in his 10th season when he can get the biggest possible contract if he wants to sign a long-term deal anywhere. And also you look at this and, and this gives you leverage if it's a place to that you want to stay at. Lots of times yes. we've seen guys in the midst of their deals requesting a trade or wanting out or not wanting to be there. They, they don't have any leverage other than going somewhere else. This allows Kawhi to have leverage in a place and at a point where he's not necessarily needing to say, I, I you need to do this. Right. I want to go somewhere. He could still stay there, but now he has the power because he's not stuck in a contract for another few years. Even when you go back home, you need leverage. LeBron, he showed you that. Dan Gilbert, not bringing back the general manager. Ah, you know something? Championship, we got one. He was so satisfied mm -hmm. with that. So, man, Kawhi, he won't have that problem. Even though he's back at home, still keep the pressure on the organization and his owner. Let me tell you, he might have a lot of problems in life, but money won't be one of them. Do we, th do we think Kawhi stays in the, with the Clippers? Is there any part of this that's because Kawhi's not sure that's I where think he wants to be? Th th see, to me, I, th I, I don't want to start speculating that Kawhi doesn't want to be a Clipper before he's even played a game as a Clipper. I, I think can this say is this. Kawhi wants to be a Clipper. The only deal to be made by his team was to do a two plus one. So he can be a free agent at that 10th year. He wants to, he don't want to put, wear another uniform. But it don't make sense for him to sign for four years, even though he still has that same thought process. Right. There, if you look at the guys who have signed long-term deals, the, the, that, that didn't have to. Steph did it because he has full faith in the organization. He was eligible for the Supermax. They'd won championships. He didn't need to exert pressure. LeBron going to the Lakers signing for the maximum years was to signal to the rest of the league, I am here to stay. Come join me. Like they're, they're, But if you're not in that type of position, Position, unless you are really concerned about injury or about your ability to continue playing at a high level, you might as well continue to hit free agency as early as and often as possible to keep pressure and to keep viable, flexible options. Because what the other thing for Kawhi, I'm sure he wants to be a Clipper, but what if two? What if something happens to Paul George and Lou Williams, and all of a sudden it's like, man, like through nobody's fault, some catastrophic injury, like. Can I win a championship here? That flexibility is a good thing to have. Flexibility, leverage, and I do think he gave up money coming to the Clippers, money he could have had. Mm -hmm. This allows him to get to that super max with the 10-year at age 30 and make a lot more money there on the back end with a new contract. All right, let's talk some football now. Last season, Todd Gurley ran for 1,200 yards, scored 17 touchdowns on the ground. What fans remember, however, was his performance in the NFC title game and the Super Bowl, where he had a combined 45 yards on just 14 attempts and zero explanation why. Well, Gurley says he's got nothing to prove this season. See, are you buying Todd Gurley will return to form this coming year? Well, I, I, I'm not going to talk about is he going to return to form. I'm going to be more concerned about the comments for which he said. I don't know an elite person in any field that says, you know something, I got nothing to prove. The best in any field, they wake up every day with nothing to prove. When I go on TV five days prove. with something to prove, like every day I'm on TV, I'm trying to prove something. Todd Gurley, I don't even know why he even said that. Like, is he trying to protect himself just in case he doesn't have success? Because all the other players, Tom Brady, he is the best example. He's sending out videos. Man, I got something to prove. He's got something to prove every year, and that's why he's been able to have the long career that he's had. Dennis Green taught me something, and I didn't know this, because typically we're always evaluating other players. He told me once before in our end-of-the-season meeting, 
Chris, do you know I evaluate the team? I was like, yeah, I understand that. He said, do you know I break it down position by position, group by group, offense, defense, and ultimately, Chris, I rate the players on our roster top to bottom, 1 to 53. And I like to let the players know where they stand on that roster because ultimately when I get to the salary cap, the salary cap is going to be a reflection of my ranking of what the team is. So every year, man, I was not going to be out of the top five ranked Vikings at the end of the season. And I'm talking about we had some great players, not good ones, not just Pro Bowl players. I played with seven different Hall of Famers. So when you start breaking down your own team, forget about what your own personal goals are. People are judging you. So let me tell you what the Rams front office, Les Snead, he's evaluating. He got something to prove to him. So I, you won't hear players in the NFL say what Todd Gurley said. Oh, I got nothing to prove. Guys who don't have nothing to prove, in a couple years, you know what they're doing? They're watching the NFL. They're not continuing to play in the NFL. And if he's got an arthritic knee, if he can't rush for 12, 1,300 yards, there's no way Todd Gurley's going to be a backup. He's not going to be a special teams player. Like, this is a year to be able to prove that that contract is worth it and he can have a long career compared to being a flash in the pan. Listen, I am, I'm legitimately concerned about his knee, and I think everyone is. I, I'm not selling the, my Todd Gurley stock yet, but I, I'm not buying more of it. I think you have to look at the way he ended last season with in the comments from was it his agent or is his trainer? It was his trainer that said he's got an arthritic condition. Like n- none of those things, which are in good, and of itself was was weird odd. That we the, were the whole even thing, hearing all of it's been that. odd. Watching yeah. him limp into his car on that TMZ video was, was concerning. Really concerning. The, the way they used him in the Super Bowl was con- and the NFC Championship game was concerning. Like C.J. Anderson is all of a sudden some premier running back. The fact that they spent a third round pick was it? On Malcolm Brown, or I'm sorry, Daryl Henderson. Malcolm Brown was already on the roster. Mm -hmm. Daryl Henderson, a guy that averaged like seven yards per, eight yards per touch last year at Memphis. That was concerning. There were a lot of red red flags for Gurley. But to Chris's point about the salary cap and your performance, he signed that big deal. But I, I looked into it this morning. It is, the way that deal works is, it is third day of the league year big roster bonus. Third day of the le- league year big roster bonus. It meaning that if Todd Gurley is not Todd Gurley next year, the Rams, I think, would owe him $7.5 million in a roster bonus on the third day of the league year next year. They wouldn't have to pay that. They could say, you know what? We, there's a reason we have Daryl Henderson. We like Malcolm Brown, and we, we'll eat the dead money on the cap. And we so, gotta pay Jared Goff. Gotta pay 100. percent Jared Goff's waiting on a contract. So like the they they paid him early and they paid him a lot, but they have outs on the deal. And I'm not wishing that upon Todd Gurley. I think when healthy, he's the best all around back in football. Right. But the, uh, he has a ton to prove. Because of it, if last year hadn't ended that way, he still would, to Chris's point. If you want to be an elite performer, I think all of us they would try to prove things to people every day, or even if you have to create doubters in your own mind, you try yes. to prove them wrong. But a guy that's coming off a very disappointing and questionable end of the season, he's got more to prove now than any time since he became this level player that we that we expect him to be. And Cece, correct me if I'm wrong, it's not like he has an injury he could heal and come back. He's got an arthritic knee. Arthritis is going to be there. It's something he's going to have to work through. He's yes. not going to have to be fully healed, and then he's back to the Todd Gurley we saw. So you don't, we don't expect him to ever get out now and be 100% if he's already dealing with the arthritis. Todd Gurley are, already had a questionable knee coming into the league. Obviously, the pounding. Typically, you have arthritis. That means it's bone on bone. The cartilage is there. I got an arthritic shoulder, but I'm 53 doing TV. I can do that. (laughs) All right? You don't see running backs. Not unless it's someone like Jerome Bettis, someone who's a battering ram, someone going to get about 4.2 yards a carry, someone going to be great in the red zone, doesn't need to avoid people as much. But just imagine Marshall Falk early in his career having an arthritic knee. Or Ed's James. That's the difference between having four or five good years and being a Hall of Famer. So for me, based on the talent, the arthritic knee, it takes away his breakaway speed. It takes away his ability to be an elite receiver out of the backfield. So to me, this is one of the big storylines for the Rams. If they are a Super Bowl favorite, if they're a favorite to be in the NFC Championship game and to represent in the Super Bowl, 
Todd Gurley's got to be the Todd Gurley that we saw early last season and the previous season. And, and that's because so much of their offense, the reason they can go 11 personnel after 11 personnel, they're in the same formation more than any team in football, is because so much of what they do pre-snap and post-snap with the play action is based on the threat of Todd Gurley. But just real quick, tell me if you agree with me on this scene. I don't want to read too much into this, these three words, nothing to prove. But that strikes me as a bit of denial. Like a bit of, no, 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 I'm, man, I, everybody knows who I am in this league. Almost a little bit, I mean, I'm Kevin, Kevin Durant. Durant. Well, okay, but Kevin Durant is, was in, is in one place, tw 11, 10 years into the league, winning MVP, multiple championships. Todd Gurley, coming off, that was before KD got injured, coming off an injury, trying to still establish himself as, is he going to be a, a story of a player that you remember him, oh, Todd Gurley, man, he was unbelievable for a few years, or a Marshall Falk, that's what he's got left to prove, and there's a decade to do that. Yeah, Kevin Durant, he said that, and we have forgot who he was. But immediately, Kevin Durant. Reminded us. He reminded came us. Came back out, scored like 40-something the very I, next I, game. He reminded us. Todd Gurley, remind me, man. Yeah. yeah. I, I played in the league a long time. My memory ain't what it used to be. <laughs> remind me of the Todd Gurley that it used to be. Stories to start your morning. The yellow hair, man. Yesterday was revealed that Kawhi Leonard signed Not even a creep too. People won't know it's him. <laughs> signed a three-year deal creep, worth creep, 103 creep. million dollars with the Clippers. Some thought it would be four years. It was just three. See what he make of Kawhi's new deal. Well, it really speaks to they weren't concerned with his overall health because if he was, he would sign a long term. But it also it clarifies something that even I didn't know. Toronto, we thought, was the only place for a short-term deal. They were only going to sign a short-term deal so that he could be a free agent after that important temp season. Nick. Right, and so now he's doing it in L.A., and it also keeps the pressure on the Clippers. It lines his free agency up with Paul George's. And, by the way, LeBron's potentially, and maybe Giannis's if they don't get him locked up. 2021 is going to be like 2019. It sets it up that Kawhi, the board man, board man gets paid, mm -hmm. calls LeBron, say, you're tired of losing over there. Oh, uh, oh, you you want to come across the hallway? You want to join a winner? Oh, so you're just already assigning the Clippers a title or two. Okay. I'll see. I see you. All right. Speaking of the Lakers, Save injury clip, update on Boogie Cousins. Boogie Cousins is injury free. Boogie tore his quad in the first round of the playoffs against the Clippers. He was able to come back playing the finals, but clearly he wasn't fully healthy. Would you say C barely jumped over a pizza box? Yeah. Boogie now says his quad is 100 percent healed. All right, Nick, I'll start with you. What are your what are your fair expectations for Cousins next season? I think Boogie, if this is true, should be able to get back to the level we saw him at with Golden State at the end of the regular season, mm -hmm. where he was not the Sacramento Kings or New Orleans Pelicans Boogie Cousins, but was still one of the top six or seven centers in the league and a positive offensive player, even if he was still a negative defensively. I, I have been holding against him because I can't get over the memory of how unathletic he yeah. looked in the finals. The eye test. The, in the finals, he looked slow and, oh, it looked like it was over for him. But we talked off the air and on the air – we thought he wasn't even going to be able to play in the finals. If, I, if he hadn't forced himself onto the court, rehab so hard, Good point. then I wouldn't be as concerned about him. So I don't want to hold against him his hard work, even though it's hard not He's to. He's the best buy in the NBA at $3.5 million. He's got a lot to prove this year. He should be a starter, but he gets the opportunity that now he's not rehabbing. He's got two and a half months of conditioning, cardio work, explosive work, that he can get back to the form that we saw him when him and, him and AD played there in New Orleans. I believe he'll be closer to that than the boogie we saw last time in the finals. All right. Uh, on to the NFL now. The folks over at Pro Football Focus have predicted that Ezekiel Elliott will win his third rushing title this season. Zeke would be the first back to win three rushing titles in four seasons since Barry Sanders. See, you think Zeke leads the league in rushing next season? Well, there's really only one challenger besides a sleeper. That's Barkley. You say, like, okay, Barkley with the Giants. Who else is out there? You're not, going, you, you're not going to go L. Bell his first year with the Jets. You ain't know nothing about the system they're going to run, their offensive line. Who else are you going to? Ty Gurley? Oh, I ain't got no goals this year. I ain't trying to get no better. <laughs> Christian Never. McCaffrey. 
I don't think he's going to carry the ball well, enough. enough he, total yards. Total, maybe now, he yards might be a thousand, thousand. Best pure runner, though. Mm -hmm. He happens to come from the Ohio State University and plays for the Cowboys. I'm sure the Cowboys would like both, but if they could only pick one category for Zeke to lead the league in, I bet they would pick touchdowns over rushing yards. The, what hurt the Cowboys last year pre and post Amari Cooper was their efficiency inside the 10, inside the 5. They need to turn those 3s into 7s. So, yeah, Zeke's the best hand the ball off, run the ball player in the league, the best pure running running back in the league. But it's more about scoring than total yards for the Cowboys this season. Time now for Nick's favorite oh. part of the show. Nick makes a list. Delightful. So the Raptors won the title, but the entire league has been shaken up ever since. Today, my friend, you're ranking the top teams in the NBA. Yes, this is how I imagine we will start the season with this hierarchy. I don't think there's going to be any other major moves aside from Russell Westbrook. And if he goes to Miami, it wouldn't put them into the top seven. I like seven, uh, seven teams, seven person lists. We'll start with number seven, the Brooklyn Nets. Here's why I have them there, see? You said you thought there's a good chance Kevin Durant could play next season. If he does, they immediately become real I believe real that's contenders. his attitude. That is attitude. That he is, that we should not, let me put it like this, we shouldn't cross him off for the year. We shouldn't say he's out right now. And if he comes back with the East only having two real other contenders, to me, you've got to include them based on what we've seen from KD. Mm, you're off to a shaky start. Okay, number six, Utah. An elite starting five. Mike Conley, Donovan Mitchell, Joe Ingles, Boyan Bogdanovich, Defensive Player of the Year. Rudy Gobert. They added Ed Davis. They made some other additions to their depth. This is a team that if your guy Donovan Mitchell can take a, take a leap in efficiency, they could be the best starting five top to bottom in the NBA. Donovan Mitchell could be most improved with Conley being the distributor that he is, a point guard and also a great leader. Former Buckeye there. Donovan Mitchell, watch out, most improved in the NBA. And, and with Boyan adding to the floor spacing. Yeah, Number I thought about him, but I didn't want to pronounce his name. No problem. Boyan Bogdanovich. Number five, yeah. the Houston Rockets. Speaking of starting fives, they bring their entire starting five back. They had the best record in the NBA after the the second half of last season. You, there's if they it, remember the final game of the year last year, final day of the season. The Rockets fell from the two seed to the four seed. If that day goes differently, who knows what happens in the NBA playoffs? I know there's been a lot of bad headlines with the Rockets. They got that same unit coming back that was very dangerous after 11 and 14. Nothing's starts. changed with the Rockets. Still squabbling behind the door, behind closed doors. Right, number four, Philly, should be the best defense in the Eastern Conference. And the only reason I can't say the best defense in the whole league is because of what the Clippers added this past week with Kawhi and Paul George. Mm -hmm. We know how good Joel Embiid is. Al Horford's been excellent year after year. Tobias Harris, if he can get back to Clippers, Tobias Harris, it wasn't quite as good as a Sixer. And then the big X factor is, of course, one Ben Simmons. But the Sixers are clearly the second best team in the Eastern Conference. Okay, you're off to you. Okay. Number three, your team. The L.A. Clippers, Kawhi, Paul George, Lou Williams, Doc Rivers. They're not and, my team at their number three, okay, well, but go ahead. Okay, well, it's I, your list. You might have them higher than that. The Clippers I've got number three because of what we saw them do last year, plus the additions of Kawhi and Paul George. Number two, the best duo in basketball, the Lakers with LeBron and Anthony Davis. I love the Danny Green addition. We'll see what Boogie can add, and we'll see how Frank Vogel does it, but they have, they're the only team in the league with two top seven players. And number one, the team that I thought was going to end last year, number one. They did end last regular season, number one. They ended last year with the MVP, the 61 Milwaukee Bucks. Kawhi's gone. This is an enormous year for that organization with Giannis being able to be presented a quarter of a billion dollar contract next offseason. The Bucks should have the best record in the NBA home court throughout. See if Giannis can repeat. Can I just MVP. say, can you imagine if a year ago I told you the Warriors are not going to be one of the top seven teams on oh. Nick's list to potentially be one of the best next year? And Nobody would have believed it. Pick the no. team that Kevin Durant went to that he might not play for a year is ranked ahead of them. Mm -hmm. yep. I just don't agree with the top of the list, too. That Milwaukee drug you've been on for over a year, it's so, doing can, something to you. Who would, can and, you tell me who you'd have number one? The Clippers. Oh, okay. We had the subject yesterday. Who was a better team? Wait, would Clippers, you, you, Lakers. Clippers, Lakers, Bucks. The Bucks, they got to prove themselves to me. I put them a little bit ahead of Philadelphia right there. Okay. What I saw with Giannis in the final, there's no way I can put him above a Kawhi team. All right? So having him number one, two ahead of Kawhi's team, man, get that mess out of here. Okay. After he put the claw on him and locked him up, made it do what it do. <laughs> that's, that's my line. That's your line. Sort of. Anyway. Yep. 
Back here at Sarah Kustoff, talking Russell Westbrook. So yesterday on the gram, he liked a picture of himself wearing a Heat jersey, Mark even though he's still a member of the Thunder. What's that? Who's what was that? It was on Instagram. On, the on, gram. There the gram. you go. That's what we were trying to get you to say again. Well, yeah, like you know, don't let them hate on you. Sounds good. Jenna. <laughs> you think that's my choice? <laughs> uh, a new report says that the Heat are willing to take on Russ's money. They're also willing to take on Russ's personality. Sarah, how does Russ need to adjust his game moving forward? if he wants to be more effective? Or is there no adjustment that he's going to make? I, yeah, I think you got to keep trying. I mean, it, Russell Westbrook is supremely talented. We know that so much of his game is predicated on his athleticism, on his motor, uh, on the aggressiveness and assertiveness of which he plays. But it always has come down to the word efficiency. It, and that's been the because biggest Because that factor. works if those shots are going in and if you're doing the right thing. Right, right. But I think for Russ, and we saw him throughout the course of different seasons taking more three-point shots and the pace he plays – and, and, and that's where shot selection for any player is always a major f factor in mm -hmm. how good they are and how effective they are. And that's where Russell Westbrook struggles. And, and you, you can't tell me that a player that can make up his mind, as he did against the Lakers, to go out and get 20, 20, and 20 can't be someone that could be a dominant force on a team. However, that's a great point. You've, you've got, I mean, that, that is extraordinary. And so you can't tell me he wouldn't be a major addition to a team that's got a great infrastructure, an excellent head coach, someone that understands how to utilize different pieces and role players in a, in a player like Jimmy Butler, but it will have to come down to careful strategy, careful game planning on how to figure out the best places to put Russell Westbrook, how to make sure that the coach is the one, and whether this is, is pregame, postgame, offseason, preseason, going through film, showing him good. And, and I don't know, and, and these are things I truly don't know. I talk to people from Oklahoma City that enjoy playing with Russ, that like Russ, that have enjoyed coaching Russ, uh, that believe in what he can be, but it's all about trying to show him what shots he should and shouldn't be taking, end of game situations. And we saw him last year, which I know Nick has talked about, deferring to Paul George and, and giving him opportunity to really take over that team. However, when push comes to shove, I think more of the issues with Russ come down to the fourth quarter, fourth quarter decisions, mm -hmm. decision making at the end of the game. And that's where he often falls short. And those are the areas of which you would need to make sure to improve. It's about his jump shot. More than anything. It's, it starts and almost ends with his jump shot. The last two years, he has led the league in assists. He is the best rebounder at his position in the league. We know how hard he works, that he takes no games off. Now, you might want him to see a little more effort on the defensive end that he puts on the offensive end, but that is the case for 85% of the players in the league. The problem is he takes shots as if he's a very good shooter. And last year, he was a horrible shooter. And over the course of his career, he's been an average shooter. And he's now in a position where he's the second worst high volume three point shooter in the history of the NBA. Only Charles Barkley has taken at least 2,000 threes at a lower percentage than And most. Charles Barkley, the game was changing at that point. He was forced because he had lost a lot of his athleticism. He couldn't play above the rim. His post game would be enhanced if he was able to shoot. So he, it, his game was forced to shoot those three. I don't know what's happened in Russ's career that makes him think he should take 400 threes. Right. Well, it, it's, it, it's crazy. And everybody knows it but him. Yeah. And it is – I don't think he's going to stop – shooting threes entirely. In fact, I don't think he should stop shooting threes entirely. It, the question is, can he get back to just average, slightly below average, three-point shooting? Like for the league-wide, if he can shoot 34% from three, which we've seen him do in a couple of seasons, then he goes back to being, without question, one of the 12 most effective players in the league, a dominant force. It's when he's shooting like he did the first half of last year, the first 50 games of last year, 25% from three, that it's a, that he can become a net negative efficiency-wise on your offense. And we'll see who Miami, if, if this does in fact 
go through and who they would trade, what the roster fills out. Miami is a team that over the last couple, it's not like they've had a lot of strong three-point shooters necessarily. This isn't a team mm -hmm. that much of their game and system and offensively is surrounding three-point shooters. We saw Dwayne Wade be such a extraordinary player for them with much of what he does is in the mid-range. Much of what So they are accustomed and used to working with players and getting the best out of players that aren't knocked down three-point shooters. And so I think part of that, too, comes back to getting Russ to understand the system, how they're going to play, and where he is supposed to be getting his shots from in the context of the offense. Pat Riley is used to going out, making blockbuster deals, getting big-time NBA players. And I'll, this takes me back to when he signed Shaquille O'Neal. And when he signed Shaq, it was clear, this is Dwayne Wade's team. And they told him that. And they had other specific things that they put in place. He had a weight clause in his contract as far as practice, the nightlife. Like, they came down hard on Shaq. Shaq made the adjustments. Won him another championship. Now, Russ, will he do that? Because I know Pat Riley did that for Dwayne Wade when he had to defer to LeBron. He did that to LeBron. Was LeBron at the right playing weight? His overall condition. They made him change some things. Chris Bosh, when he signed, they forced him to change some things. Now, will Russ be able to listen to Pat Riley? Because Pat Riley is demanding, and if they trade for Russ, he can't continue to play this way. I'd be shocked if he shot 400 threes for a team that's run by Pat Riley. Can he be successful if he doesn't play this way? Or well, are you going to see what you saw last year? No, well, I think that he the this is the way he elongates his career. I mean, this is going to be year 12 now. He is no he was for a long time a top 3 raw athlete in the league. I don't think he is that anymore. I, I think he's still a top 15 raw athlete, but that's going to go down each and every year. The way guards can play 15, 16 years is if they develop a shot. Why did Jason Kidd get to play, what, damn near 20 years? Because he developed a shot after not having one early in his yep, career. He could play off the ball he, those last few years. And won a championship yep. after never winning, getting to two finals with the Nets but not winning a title. Like, Russ has the respect of the entire league. Everyone knows how much it means to him. People respect his loyalty, his tenacity, his fearlessness. But at some point for Russ, it's got to be less heart and more head. And that has been the, the struggle for him. Now I will say, you mentioned Pat Riley. I'll say another name. Spolster would be the best coach he's ever had by an enormous margin. Could the culture shock of being traded, of it not working, it, it, it came close to working with Durant, but it didn't. It didn't work the year no one was there. It didn't work the two years Paul George was there. Then George leaves. Now you're traded. Is that enough of a shock to the system for Russ to finally recognize, I've got to adjust? If not, then he'll be what he is, which is a future first ballot Hall of Famer, a great player of his era, but a guy who in some ways couldn't get out of his own way. Moving on to LeBron and the Lakers now. Last week it was reported that LeBron would be the team's de facto point guard next season. From there, a plethora of potential Laker lineups for this team were thrown around. This was all before we heard from the head coach. Yesterday at Summer League Play, we heard from the head coach. Frank Vogel was asked about his team's lineup. Here's what he had to say. There is no decisions made on our starting lineup. Um, no imminent plan to start LeBron at the point guard spot. Uh, a lot of different uh, lineups and combinations have, dis have been discussed, but it's, it's really way too early for any of that. Um, he'll be a primary ball handler uh, in our system the same way he has been uh, his entire career, but we're certainly not going to ask him to, to do anything that he hasn't uh, done his entire career. So, um, you know, it's going to be a, a situation of just putting all our guys in the, in the best position to have success on the basketball court and looking forward for it uh, all to take place at the right time. All right, Sarah, let's let's break this down a little bit. You think that, that LeBron should be the Lakers' starting point guard? I, I love this, and I love this conversation every time this news came out. Every time we I have talked, the same one. Well, no, no, no. <laughs> but it just when, when this news came out, and I talked to a lot of players, coaches, and, and it's almost been laughable because it's like LeBron has been a point guard essentially his entire career. And we see so much – 
I understand that you need to put in your rosters and put in your starting lineups, but it's more They're a traditional way. It's a traditional but way. But the NBA right now is anything it's but. It's positionless, and it's absolutely, and it's been that way. And I'll never forget last year when the Lakers were coming to play Brooklyn, and it was a, a, a story heading in that LeBron was going to play point guard that night, and it was the first time that he'd been slotted in the roster. And it's the same story of, okay, fine. So you're writing him in, in the starting lineup. The question often comes, with the position you're playing, who are you guarding? I do not think that LeBron James is going to be guarding the opponent's starting point. But yeah, do you want the ball in his hands? Of course. Is he an excellent option given who else they could put in the lineup? Uh, I, I think this is something that when you have LeBron James on the floor, you have the opportunity to play him at one through five, and you're going to utilize him in creative ways as has been done the entirety of his career. I do think, though, as Frank Vogel said, which is you shouldn't be in a lot of this is media. A lot of it's speculation. It's going to continue when you get into preseason training camp and people are able to see kind of the way you're running things and who you're putting in. But to necessarily set a starting lineup or even be discussing it at this point in July, it is early. Let guys compete. Let guys compete for roles and positions. And then once you start to solidify that in training camp, guys will understand their roles, where they're going to slot in. And they need to be flexible, understanding you're going to utilize different lineups given and the fact that LeBron James has got the versatility of yeah, playing I'm so every glad position. you said that because there's so many people that do these shows. They want to take competition out of sports. They just want a free ride. They just want, oh, let's move this guy here. What you're gonna part of the essence of a team, putting a team together, is that everyone's spot is up for grabs. You can't tell um, AD, oh, you know something, AD, you're going to play center. If AD has said, I don't want to play center. That's more important than getting his number from LeBron James, number 23. Because he doesn't want to log 30 minutes, guarding a number five, going against his body and everything. No, it's not the best thing for him. If you want me here, I'll play four, I'll play three, I'll play two, I'll bring the ball up. But he doesn't want to play center. That's all a part of making people comfortable. But the number one way to make a team comfortable is you go to training camp, you throw the ball out there, and let the best man win. We're not going to go to say, oh, we're going to be this way before the team is developed. Because if you start giving, especially young players, yeah. if you start entitling them, oh, I'm going to give you this spot compared to earn it, you will have a problem with Boogie Cousins, who started almost every game that he's participated in. Rondo, he's been a starter. If you just tell them before that, unless it's LeBron, Rondo will be like, hey, man, let me back back. LeBron James, he is a better point guard than me. So it becomes important that we don't remove competition from sports. Because what is sports without competition? But that point right there, the one you made at the end, is why... Well, a bunch of other ones, too. Okay, but that's the one I'm going to focus on. The one you made at the end is why that naming LeBron the point guard for the starting lineup is a positive and more than just, well, he's going to be the de facto point guard anyway. Because if you if it is between Rondo, Cook, and Caruso, I believe that Cook actually can be more effective on court on the court with LeBron than Rondo can because of the shooting, because of what he can do spacing the court. And Rondo and LeBron, Rondo was the only player on the Lakers last year that had a negative on-court rating when he played with LeBron. Everyone else was positive. You know why? Because LeBron was on the court, except for the minutes with Rondo. So when you name LeBron the point guard, then the other point guards on the roster know, okay, so I'm not starting. And I think Rondo is a guy who we know what a good leader he can be. We also know the other direction he can go. But the problem for the Lakers could be, you can you mentioned competition, see, and I, and I respect it, but we know three of their starters. We know it. We know LeBron's starting. We know Anthony Davis is starting. We know Danny Green is starting. There's no question about it. The salaries dictate that. Their, their, their status in the league dictates that. I keep being told they are going to start a center, that they're not going to do what I think the best lineup is, which is AD at center, that they're going to start a center. So that we don't know who, Boogie or JaVale. So that leaves one spot left, and is that going to be Kuzma? Probably should be Kuzma. If it is Kuzma, he has to get back to being a good three-point shooter. Last year, he was one of the worst in the league on open threes, 31% on 400 open to wide open three-pointers. That's terrible. His rookie season, 37% on open to wide open three-pointers. 
when you're if you're going to have AD and a center and LeBron out there, we know Danny Green can be a knockdown shooter. You need that fifth guy in your starting lineup to be a real threat from three. So that's why I can't just give it to Kuz because if he, even though he's the best guy, if he's not shooting, they're going to have to find someone who can in that role. But here's and here's the thing to go along with that, which coaches will start to figure out. We see many teams go through 10, 15, 20 starting different starting lineups throughout yes. the course of the season. It changes, but a lot of it does have. Okay, what's our second unit look like? Who who are we having anchor our second unit? Do we want Anthony Davis to play the four or the five? What does AD want to do? What conversations has he had with the coaching staff of saying where? So all of this factors in, but a lot of it too comes in with not just what is best out of that starting five, but also the depth of your team and who you're playing with the different combinations and how that benefits your team as a whole. I believe there are a couple people going to play a key role. Avery Bradley is going to be mentioned as a starter. He is a viable option because he's able to guard either the one or the two yes. yep. and take all that pressure off LeBron where he can guard a yep. three, a four, or even a two on the wing. And also, Alex Caruso. We have not talked about him. We talked about him signing. I was very impressed with him last season as far as what type of athlete. And he's going to get some minutes. Yep. Oh, yeah. Him and Quinn oh, Cook, yeah. they're going to get some minutes. But I thought what you made as far as the minutes of that second rotation it becomes very important. So Vogel, he knows this. They got their work cut out for him. But a lot of these options, they are good options. All right? Is Kuz going to be in the lineup? Is he going to shoot better? Boogie Cousins, can he earn that starting? Does he want to be split in time with JaVale McGee? Or is JaVale McGee just a backup? All these things have to be worked out in training camp. But, yes, there's always competition. But people know. There's obvious. There's only a couple spots available with LeBron, with AD. Besides that, Danny Green, yes, but he still has to have an impressive yep. training camp. Frank Vogel may know what his options are, but that doesn't alleviate the pressure of being there and making the right choices, of putting the right lineup out there, trying to make AD happy. He doesn't want to play the five, trying to make LeBron happy with the point, trying to make Kuz happy by play. That's a lot of pressure to place on a first-year coach with the Lakers. I don't think pressure is the right word to use. This is a great opportunity. Yeah. Tell me when he had a better roster. Tell me any year that Frank Vogel coached. Oh, it's not that even we, close. That part's not even thank close. Thank you. That so, part's not even close. So how could it be that much pressure? Well, the pressure got, will be to get off to a good start. The pre, Because there's the, the, the stories in the L.A. Times are already written about Jason Kidd. So yeah, the pressure, but tell me when he didn't have that. You okay. tell me he didn't have pressure when he was in Indiana? He didn't have pressure with an Orlando team that didn't have a bunch of talent? Right, but I think because, and maybe we're, maybe it's semantics, because it's the most talented roster he's ever had, the expectation's the highest they've ever been, and you've got Jason Kidd looming in the background, th th that's where the pressure will be. But Frank Vogel is, listen, Frank Vogel, didn't think he was going to be the head coach of an NBA team this year after failing in Orlando and then seeing Orlando once he left jump to the playoffs. He knows what an opportunity this is, but there is some juggling here. There is, you mentioned highlight Avery Bradley. When the starting lineup I think most people expect is LeBron, Danny Green, Kuzma, Anthony Davis, and a center. In that starting lineup, who guards the opposing point guard? You're gonna you're gonna have Danny Green do it, who's the, one of the best wing defenders in the league. That's not asking. That's not getting the most out of his. Kuzma can't do it. You're not gonna ask year 17 LeBron to do it. So there is some juggling that's gonna have to be done here. Not to mention Boogie and Rondo. Can you convince them? If you know what. Be, be run our second unit for us. Like Rondo, maybe you can, but Boogie, if he's, we, I saw him in the video yesterday, he saw, he's slimmed down, he says he's fully healthy. Those are the things that Frank Vogel has to start working on right now. It's probably one of the reasons he did that interview. Tell the whole team, none of our, star uh, everything's up for grabs. Nothing's yet. decided, go earn it. Thank you for listening to the First Things First podcast. Remember, leave us a review and tell us what you think. Subscribe to the podcast on Apple Podcasts and catch us on FS1 Monday through Friday, 6.30 a.m. Eastern. For Chris Carter and Nick Wright, I'm Jenna Wolf. So long, everybody.